Amen. Thank you for that tonight. If you have your Bibles, open Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians 4, if you need a handout, would you raise your hand? The usher will come bring you one as we finish up our series tonight on Why Church. Why Church? Need a handout like this? Raise your hand, and they'll bring you one. I'm sure they will. They're back there. Thanks, Brother Lee, and thanks, Brother Rupal, back there for helping. So we've turned to Ephesians chapter 4 and finish up. We looked at what is church for a few weeks and tried to define from the Bible some elements of a church. And then we looked at which church, why do we come to a Baptist church as opposed to Catholic or opposed to Lutheran or as opposed to just a congregation or a community church. And now we're looking at why church or what, what is our response now at church. And young people up in the balcony, but I'd like you to pay attention while I'm preaching. All right, thanks so much for that. Appreciate that. And yes, I can still see you, even though, uh, even though you're far away. When Pastor Lett was here, all right, of course, he had to have glasses at the end of his life. And at the end of his life, he's still alive. Yikes. <laughs> no, later on, he had the glasses to see. I can still see just fine. And another couple years, then I'll be out of commission, I'm sure. And so... But I appreciate that. Thanks for helping with that, young people. In Ephesians chapter 4, as we look at why church, or what is our response to church? A couple questions are on your piece of paper. What is my purpose at church, and what should my response be at church? Why do we come to church? Is it just so that we don't have guilt in our life? And I hope that's not why you come to church, just so you don't have any guilt. Our slogan here, our, our logo here at First Baptist Church is Building Bridges. All right, and how that plays out, we believe that we're trying to build bridges to Jesus Christ. Those who don't know Christ, build a bridge to Jesus Christ. Those who have troubled relationships, build a bridge to healthy relationships through the power of Jesus Christ. We're trying to build a bridge to victory. Now, those who struggle and build a bridge to service, we're trying to build bridges. But there are other slogans from different churches. One is, come to church guilt-free. Now, what does that mean? Yeah, I'll tell you what it means to me. I, I read that the other day, and I thought, boy, they're trying to appeal to somebody who they can come to church, and no matter how they live, no matter what decisions they're making in life, no matter what choices they make, they should, have, they should feel when they leave church no condemnation on their choices. Guilt-free church. By that slogan implying that when you come to church, you get a pat on the back, a nice donut, perhaps, and you have a nice day. The issue I have is that when I read throughout my Bible, there are some times that, that there is some guilt associated with that because of wrong decisions, wrong choices, wrong actions. Jesus did not just give everyone a piece of bread, a piece of fish, and send them on their way. He began to preach unto them the kingdom of God. And so it's important when we come to church what our response and what our purpose is at church. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, the Bible says this, Paul, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself or the building of itself up in love. Lord, thank you for this time. I pray that you would help us in these next few moments. Lord, I pray that you would direct me as I speak. Lord, may these final thoughts, may they be helpful to us. Lord, may they challenge us and convict us. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. What is your purpose at church? Now, we're going to go in regards and in context of First Baptist Church, but um, wherever you go to church, if you're online somewhere else, then you ought to have a purpose at your church. Can I just stay at home and watch preaching? Well, I can and if that's all there is to church, then why meet together? If, if church just is about watching something, well, we can probably find uh, some better music, though you'd be hard-pressed to a church. You can definitely find a better preacher, no doubt about that. No doubt about that. But isn't church a little bit more, I heard that, Brother Treadway, uh, isn't church a little bit more than just watching something? Well, it is. From the Bible, it is something a little bit more. What should our response be? I need to know what I'm supposed to do now. I want to look at tonight some responses to church. What are we supposed to do? The first thing that we're supposed to do at church is to invest in church. These all begin with letter I, so if you want to, you can jump down the line and try to figure them all out. 
All right, I know you do anyway, all right? Uh, invest. Invest is the first one. Malachi 3.10, bring ye all the tithes in the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Invest in that first blank in the church. Invest in the church. Now, some of you tonight are thinking, I knew it. I knew that the whole point of this series was to ask us for more money. This whole series on church was just a gigantic fundraising campaign. Wrong. But I tell you, I'll repeat what Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. One of our responses to church, the right church, going to church, is to invest in church, and that means invest with my finances. My wife and I, we give to this operation, all right, because we're members here. I happen to be the pastor, but we're members here as well. I'm a member, I'm a voting member. When there's a, a budget, I vote for or against my own budget now. <laughs> I've always voted for my budget, in case you're wondering how I voted. But we're supposed to invest in the church. If I can submit this, I believe investing in church will be the best investment that I will ever make. Now, you can make your own decision on that, but I believe that if I lay my treasure up with God, that he'll do a whole world of good with it better than I ever could do. I enjoy investing. I enjoy doing those things, but I give to the church to invest into this church. The church, a couple thoughts, why? The church, remember, was created by Jesus Christ. This church was not man's idea. Church was God's idea. This is not some Ponzi scheme, some multi-level marketing scheme where you get a kickback the more people you get to come to church and you give and we build time. No, no, no. This was God's idea. I want to invest in what God created here. Number two, the church is how the world is changed. It is the medium for the gospel of Jesus Christ through the church. And we try hard at First Baptist Church. We don't always bat a thousand. I don't know any place it does, but we try to make sure that as, we, as I spend money, as we spend money, that we spend it in things that will further the kingdom of God, invest in the kingdom, long-term investments. The Lord has been gracious to us this past year uh, through the midst of COVID, some things that we did. The Lord has brought to fruition and brought some fruit from that. I think the largest ministry that was started last year was our TV broadcast ministry. And we are on a regular basis seeing fruit from that ministry. And God has been gracious. Guys, just got numbers from the last month and continually to trend up. People are watching. We're trying to be faithful preaching the gospel. We're trying to invest with our finances so that we can further the kingdom of God. He's got to do it. We just do our part. We invest. Why? Because the church was created by Jesus. The church is how the world is changed, and the church is supported or upheld by Jesus. We invest in the church. Not only with our finances, you invest uh, with your talent. You invest with your time. Uh, there'll be different Places that you can give of yourself and the Easter hunt, uh, the, the, the Easter egg hunt is coming up and there'll be work days around here and days uh, that will ask you to get involved in. And you know what, you might not have time for everything and I don't think anyone should do every single thing here, but you can do something. You can give a little time here, maybe a little time there. And uh, that's as we invest in the church for where your treasure is, there your heart be also. You may not realize this, but I love First Baptist Church. I love this place. I spend a whole lot of time here at this place. Early in the morning, sometimes late at night, sometimes, well, most weekends I'm here. All right, I'm here about every Sunday of the year, First Baptist Church. I love being here. I am glad that my family loves being here. I want my kids to love this place. They're in SOS tonight. They love SOS. They don't grumble on the way to church, at least not yet. Maybe next year, as Johnny comes a teenager, perhaps that'll happen, but they don't grumble. And I want them to love church like I love church, and I want them to love this church. I love this church. Is it a perfect church? Nope, I'm here. It's not perfect. You're here. We're here. But hopefully, prayerfully, it's a church where Jesus shows up. And boy, God has just touched this church the last uh, years, and, and God has been gracious to us. We invest in the church. But number two there, we all, not only invest in the church, we invest in the members. We're supposed to invest in each other at church. Why church? Because we're supposed to invest. How do we invest in the member? In the members, here's some, some things, phrases for you. First of all, love on others. 
Remember that, we looked at that Sunday night, that is the mark of a disciple of Jesus Christ, love toward someone else who is saved. You ought to be investing and loving on other people around you. Do me a favor, look around the auditorium, look left, look right, what do you see? Well, I, you know, Pastor, I see a whole lot of, whole lot of nothing, perhaps. I see some funny looking people, some, some happy people, some sad people. I see old, I see young, I see intelligent, I see more intelligence. What do you see? You see people. People who need some love and we can love on each other. You ought to love on people when you, when you come to church and outside of church as well. But when you come to church, you love on people. How can you do that? You can talk to them in the hallway. I'm glad to see you. Give them a warm smile. You can even... If I'm not looking, shake their hand, right? Pass the COVID germs around. Love on other people. Oh, man, I, I have been privileged to, be, to have been loved on. Our family has been loved on from people at this church. I still remember when my wife's father passed away. And uh, not quite suddenly, but, but we had to get out there pretty quickly. I was amazed and touched by all the responses from this church family. Uh, many of you wrote us a card. Some of you slipped money uh, into our hands and into cards for us. Boy, God was so gracious, and you were so kind. You loved on us. And I know you do that to each other as well. Many of you do that because the people who are loved on come and talk to me. Can you believe this happened, Pastor? That You think it may just be a little deal. No, no, it's a big deal to love on somebody. And you think it may just be a smile. It may just be 20 bucks. But I tell you what, that matters to people. That's a big deal. Invest in the members of this church. Invest in other people. Love on others. The second blank there, fellowship with others. I hope you don't just come in and, and run in and run out these doors. I hope you stick around and talk to people. And yet you find out what's going on in their life. You don't stick around and talk to them to let them know what's going on with you, but find out what's going on with them. Talk with them. Cry with them. Laugh with them. My greatest friends are in this church right here. My family's in this church, physically and spiritually. I'm closer to, 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 to most of you than I am even more so than some of my other family members. Fellowship with, with each other. I still remember I was here just a few years as assistant pastor and ran into, I think it was the Phil Hearts. Ran into them, I was at Menards. Sat there talking for, uh, boy, probably 20, 25 minutes. I remember walking away from that as a young youth pastor being amazed, man, I would not have talked to this older couple apart from Jesus Christ. But because of Jesus Christ, I just had a 20, 25 minute conversation at a hardware store. Fellowship with the members. And I enjoyed it. We love on others. We fellowship with others. You ought to help others. You ought to help others. How do you help them? Boy, you carry their burdens. Help carry the load. And this church is, is excellent at that as well. You, you can encourage them, add to their joy. When you, when you come to church and you come around someone else, sometimes you're going to come with burdens. Sometimes you're going to come with needs. Sometimes you're going to come with, with requests with a heavy heart. But your emphasis when you come to church, why church, ought to be to invest in somebody else. You may have had a bad day. It may be a bad week. It may be a bad month. It may be a terrible year. It may be a terrible life. Some people, it seems, get the short end of the stick every time, it seems. You can still invest in someone else. It may be a good day. It may be a good week. It may be a great month. It may, it may be the best year of your life. Then you better be investing in other people when you come to church here and seek to help them and encourage them. Why church? Number one, we invest. Number two, number two, why church? Well, we ought to be involved. And I think the blank got cut off there, so it's going to be at the top of the page there, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. So you can write that in there, involved. The verse says this, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles. 
Notice that. Race doesn't matter. Bond or free. Bond or free. Social status doesn't matter. Finish the verse. And have been all been made to drink in one spirit, for the body is not one member but many. Don't you love how the Bible solves life's problems? Racism, animosity, social injustice are solved with the right view of Jesus Christ. Jesus said another passage, or the Bible says, there's neither male nor, nor female. It's, it's we're all, we're, we're just in Christ. Jew, Gentile, bond, free, doesn't matter. No matter how rich, no poor, no matter what, what your ethnicity is, we are one in Jesus Christ. That's the church. But it says we're a body. A body has all different parts, fingers and toes and elbows and knees and ears and eyes, and everything ought to function in harmony. That means your ears complement the operation. Your eyes help your feet work correctly. Your hands assist uh, what's going on. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, uh, ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You ought to get involved at church. Why church? Not only to invest, but to get involved. Get involved at church. Two things to avoid here. Two things to avoid. Number one, avoid consumer Christianity. Consumer Christianity is what's in it for me, or this thing is all about me. I come to church, so pastor, you ought to feed me at church. Don't be a consumer Christian. Though we want to serve you, you ought to want to serve each other. You do not come to church to be served, you come to serve. Don't be a consumer Christian. When you go to a restaurant, you're there to be served. You sit down and you order the drinks you want and you order the foods you want and they, if, it, if it runs low, you bring more. I remember one time, uh, early on in our dating relationship, I took my wife and her sister to a, uh, to a seafood restaurant out in New Jersey. My wife's from about 45 minutes from New York City and they have just tremendous seafood out there. We're sitting there and with me, one thing that I, I cannot stand at a restaurant is to be thirsty. At a seafood restaurant where there's butter and salt and butter and salt and butter and salt, I mean, I'm just, I'm just dying. And for whatever reason, this particular waitress was probably having a hard night and my cup was dry most of the night. And my frustration level of, of trying to eat this, we'd order these lobster pots, all right, and they were... They were, they were big, and of course, I'm dating Doreen, so I have to impress her, so I was spending a heap of money at this, at this restaurant on the water uh, in New Jersey, and uh, boy, you know, and, and my wife, if you know my wife, she can eat, and she's, you know, fist and he head deep in this pot, her sister's the same way, and I'm thirsty, and, and finally, I've, I've had it, and I'm like, man, would this waitress just bring me some water? And as I say that, I notice that my, my girlfriend, or Doreen at that time, is looking at me very strangely and looking really over my shoulder. I'm looking at Doreen, and I said, she's behind me, isn't she? And Doreen's like, <laughs> I, said, I said, well, that's going to cost me a big tip, and sure enough, it surely did. Um, I was there with a consumer mentality. I am here to be served. I'm paying you good money, and so bring me some food and bring me some water. I'm dying here. Do not come with that mentality to church. That's not why we're here at church. We're here not to be served, but to serve. A consumer mentality says, hey, feed me. It's all about me. What do you got for my kids? What do you got for our marriage? What do you got uh, activity-wise? What do you got for the sports? Boy, it's all about us. You give us a good program, we'll be in. You know, we, if it's not a good enough program, we'll go somewhere else. You can always find a better program. If program is what it's about, you'll always find someone who does it a little bit better and has something a little bit different. In worship, don't be a bystander. Don't be a bystander in worship. If there's one thing that, not one thing, but one thing that I wish that we would get is when we come here to church, we come here to worship. And you ought to be a part of that worship. When we stand to sing, it's not because we're just trying to fill a few minutes because I can't write a sermon long enough. You know well and good that I can write a long enough sermon if I need to. It's that I believe in the worship of an almighty God. So, so please, 
be a participant in worship. What does that look like? Well, when we're singing, you sing to him. And you sing from here. You sing from here. You don't worry about out here. You may be off pitch sometimes. You may be off pitch all the time. People may give you strange looks when you worship, but you worship because you love your God. Don't be a bystander in worship. Be a participant in worship. Consumer says, oh, it's a nice song. We want, we want another one. Worship. Participant says, wow, Lord, you touched my heart in that song. I want another one because I want to I know your presence. I want to be encouraged again. Boy, that was powerful. You're, you are free to sing along with the special numbers. I've, I've told you that before, but you're free to sing along with those. If it gets too distracting, all right, I'll calm you down, but we're far from that right now. We're far from that. Um, Paul would probably ask you not sing with Beth, all right? She's got a beautiful voice, and, but I'm up here, you're over there, so it's probably okay if you sing over there, but yeah, you're leaving? All right, it's good. Yep, uh, yep preach them out of church, good. <laughs> no, no. Avoid consumer Christianity. Number two, avoid convenient Christianity. Avoid convenient Christianity. The Christianity that says, I'll be involved when it fits my schedule exactly. When it's just convenient. Now, I don't envy anyone's position here. You are so faithful here to church. You're here on a Wednesday night. You serve. We have a church full of serving Christians. It's tremendous. It's wonderful. We're blessed by that. I'm not here to put guilt on you, but sometimes we get into a convenient Christianity mindset, don't we? Ah, oh, I'd like to, but that just, ugh. Just can't handle that one tonight. Oh, just can't do that. It's not convenient for me. I want to be a convicted Christian, not a convenient Christian. Meaning, I want to live my life based on the conviction. This is why I do it. Not just because it's convenient. Don't be a convenient. Avoid convenient Christianity. What's a convenient Christian look like? Well, they come to church when it fits their schedule. But if it doesn't fit, can't fit it in. They come to church, but on vacation, boy, that's a vacation. We need to relax so church doesn't fit in on vacation. Convenient Christianity. Convenient Christianity, well, I'll be a good Christian, have a smile on my face on Sunday, but come Monday, it's back to my own things. Convenient Christianity when it's just convenient. Be involved and don't just be a convenient Christian. We want to invest in church. Why church? We invest. We want to be involved. Number three. We want to be invoking. Should be a little line there. I don't see one, so I apologize for that. First Samuel 12, 23, invoking. What does that mean? To pray. To pray. Why, church? To pray for each other. Moreover, Samuel says this, Moreover, moreover as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Understand that prayer for the saints is not just a nice idea. Prayer for the saints is instructed, commanded in Scripture. We're supposed to. We're obligated. We're instructed, commanded to pray for each other. Now, hopefully when you came in tonight, you received a prayer sheet. Everybody get one of these? Why don't you talk just a couple things on this. By the way, many of you have prayed and asked about Doreen, and she is doing better today. Last night was a little bit tough, and uh, probably from her hour of rehab, she had a partial knee replacement on Monday, but many of you have asked. And uh, some of you have asked me, and somebody said, oh, I was supposed to ask you. You can ask me all day. It won't bother me. Some people don't want to be asked about updates. right? I don't mind. Uh, some people don't. Because you don't always know, it's probably usually better just to say, listen, I'm praying for you if you're really praying for them. And they can then go on and tell you if they want to, you know, have a conversation. If they don't, you'll notice on this that it says current prayer requests. See that on your sheet, current prayer requests. If you guys can take that and look at it. And so on that, we'll have prayer requests on the sheet from our members. Now, underneath, underneath, you'll see there's other requests at 2fbc.com slash prayer. Now, sometimes we'll get requests from people for um, other relatives in their family, maybe a mom, a dad, an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a best friend, uh, those things, and those are wonderful, and we will put these on here, but they will not be, just you know, they will not be on this particular prayer sheet. 
This particular prayer sheet is for our current members. All right, so when you come to church, that's all. Now, if you want to see the other ones, they'll be online on that prayer sheet. You can download it. But the one that you come to church, for two reasons. One, um, a logistical reason. If I put every one of those on here, we're back to a 14, 15-page prayer bulletin. And, and though you'd want to pray for all of them, most of you wouldn't. The other thing is, we ought to pray for each other right here. Now, some of you have extra time, and you can pray for the other ones, and I encourage you to. But you'll see on this prayer sheet, the ones you get at church on Wednesday nights, it'll have our current prayer requests on there from the current members. And, uh, and they'll stay on there for about two weeks, and then we'll take them off. You can resubmit them and get them on there. Just help us clean that up. And then some upcoming ministry requests. You ought to pray for each other. You see, well, what does prayer do? Prayer supplies needs. There's a blank there. Prayer supplies needs. You have needs? We're allowed to pray for those things. Jesus says you can ask, and I'll do it. Jesus says you, can, you have not because you ask not. Prayer supplies needs, and prayer brings healing. That's what James tells us. Prayer brings healing. Prayer, we ought to be invoking. Why, church? To be involved, to invest, to be invoking, to be praying for one another. You ought to be in prayer for the other members at First Baptist Church. And, and, and you ought to be in prayer for those in your Sunday school class, for those who sit in the same pew as you, for those who sit in the same section. You all sit in about the same spot, and eventually we'll start moving around again when we get through this COVID thing. And uh, you sit in the same spot. You know when someone's not here. Pray for them. Pray for them. You ought to pray for other members. And two more tonight. Not only should you invest and be involved in invoking, you ought to be, the next one, inviting. Inviting. Luke 14, 23. And the Lord said unto the, unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Little question there at the bottom of your page. Is it the great suggestion or the great commission? Because too often we treat it as the great suggestion. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll tell someone if it, if it works out, if I'm not too offended, if I'm, if I'm not too embarrassed about it. Remember these two truths. Number one, the last page, we talk about what is important to us. We talk about what is important to us. Grandparents, if those grandkids are important to you, you will talk about them. Hands down, no bones about it. And you'll talk to anybody who will listen to you for half a second. If Jesus is important to you, you'll talk about it. In my house, my kids talk about what's important to them. What is that? Well, it depends. Sometimes it's a situation at school that happened. Sometimes it's a current toy that they're looking at or trying to sell on Facebook Marketplace or whatnot. They talk about what's important. We all talk about men, women, moms, dads, husbands, wives, young people, old people alike. We talk about what's important to us. If you're always talking about your health, then that's the most important thing. It ought to be that what we talk about most is Jesus Christ. He ought to be most important to us. Jesus said this, for out of the abundance of of the heart the mouth speaketh what's full in here comes out here so if you're full of Jesus guess what will come out help me Jesus what if complaining comes out guess what you're full of here complaining right what's inside here will come out here we talk about what's important to us. Number two there, we talk about what has impacted us. If something has impacted you, you will talk about it. My wife just had, of course, that knee surgery on Monday. Some people sent us some remedies, ways that she could be better. Appreciate all of that. If you sent me some, praise the Lord, I'll take them all. Send them all to me, I'll send them to her. Send them to me. And I was at the, at the pharmacy today buying more things, and who knows, you know? Here, drink, take this, and take this, and take this, and maybe I'll head down to the street corner and buy that, whatever works, I guess. You know, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Wow. Wow. But what happens, I need to be there Friday night. Yeah, yeah no doubt about that. What, what, what happens is that if you've been helped by something, if you've been impacted by something, 
you will share that with somebody else. I'd like to think that Jesus Christ has impacted my life and your life. If that's the case, you ought to be sharing it with somebody else. What's the word there? Inviting. Invest, involved, invoking, be inviting. Boy, we've been, we've been blessed to see visitors here every single week. All right, every single week for the, about the past seven months. Every single week for the past seven months. Visitors here at First Baptist Church. And uh, God is gracious to us. We, the other night, were at... Uh, at the Lucky Steakhouse. Talked to the waitress and, and uh, gave her a track at the beginning and offered to pray with her. Learned that from my good friend right there. And uh, end of the meal, she comes back. And it was about 45 minutes later. She goes, you mentioned you were a, you were a minister or something, didn't you? I said, yes, ma'am. I said, I'm the pastor of First Baptist Church. She goes, I have been looking for a church. Looking for a church. Now, you know what? I get that response many times. I'm looking for something. I'm looking for something. You find out when you talk about it that, that Jesus is right. The harvest truly is plenteous. The laborers are few. I heard the other night that Brother Treadway got to lead uh, with, a, with a waiter to the Lord or a worker there at Chili's. Listen, it doesn't, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. It takes a humble, willing servant. Why, church? You ought to be inviting got to be inviting, talking about Jesus Christ. And lastly tonight, this is a little bit of a stretch, okay? All right, so don't hate me, the last blank. Tonight the blanks were investing and involved, invoking, inviting. Lastly, invading. Invading. It means coming to church, all right? I had to come, I had to get one more eye. I couldn't leave it right there. All right, so I put it last so you wouldn't mock me too much. Invading. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Well, don't make me feel guilty. I don't have to go to church. This is not about guilt, it's about grace. You're right. You don't have to go to church. You get to go to church. We live in a country that you get to go to church. You don't have to live in fear of going to church and maybe one day it'll change here. I'm so grateful for the freedoms that we have. No, you get to go to church. Boy, with that attitude, I would encourage you to go to China. Go to Iran and tell the Christians there that same thing. I don't have to go to church. You can't make me go to church. Don't make me feel guilty. And I would submit that they would say things like, that's your attitude? We would love to have a building to go to church. We would love to have the, the freedom to go whenever we wanted to, and that's your attitude? You can't make me go to church? Don't make me feel guilty? It's interesting that some, some churches, some pastors, deny that this passage deals with coming to church. I look at it, and I think it's fairly clear. All right, verse 25, and the closer we get to Jesus Christ coming, the more we ought to come to church, which reminds me of church tomorrow and Friday and Saturday. No. It's interesting that there are churches that deny this passage. All right, it's not, you don't have to come to church, but then they're so consistent that then they invite you to come to church the next Sunday morning. They still want you to come to church when they're open. That's why they have three services in a row. They still want you to come. They deny this means come to church, but they want you to come to church. Like they actually don't really believe what they're saying. You see, people who argue this verse away seem to desire that they should be in charge of their own schedule. The church fits in great. When it doesn't, don't make me feel bad. Or in other words, church ought to be about me. My friend, why church? Why church? Because church is about him. And I am blessed to be a part of it. You ought to be attending regularly, regularly, and you ought to be attending purposefully. I think if COVID did anything for us, and it did a number of things, but one thing it did for us here at First Baptist Church was bring a purposeful attendance to church. The Lord has blessed us with some moving services where God has touched us. I think you felt that. I felt that. I believe one reason is that those in attendance are coming here on purpose. 
not by accident. Definite choice. With anticipation. Church, I'm in. Church, I'm all in. Why church? It's about Him. Lord, help us that we would view church the way you view it. Lord, may it not just be about us, but about you. Lord, touch us, help us to invest and give and invite the way that you'd have us to. Lord, thank you that we can be encouraged in this place for what you're doing here at First Baptist Church. Lord, for the blessings and help. In Jesus' name, amen.